Right now, it's Matt Everett's The First Time with Kevin Parker from Tame Impala. Here we talk about Kevin's earliest musical influences, The Shadows, Fleetwood Mac and Thomas the Tank Engine. The moment his passion for music became an overwhelming force in his life and the very earliest gigs that he played. We also discuss the birth of Tame Impala, the famously difficult creation of their debut album Inner Speaker, the huge expectation that followed the success of their breakthrough record, Lonerism, and how he feels about his current status as one of the most in-demand collaborators in the whole of the music world. And we might also chat a bit about his other stage headlining slot at next week's Glastonbury Festival. But I started by asking Kevin, as I do with all my guests, when was the first time he was aware of music? I think I remember being in uh, my dad's car. Like I, I there, there's this kind of um, song, or it's kind of a band. I think I think it was the Shadows, but like, I've, I've always tried to trace back to what it was. It was something that I would just like I don't know. I can barely remember it, but I was always asking him to put it on or whatever. Yeah, I think it was the Shadows. <laughs> For the sake of argument. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, other than like, you know, obviously like Thomas the Tank Engine and stuff. Obviously, other than like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like actual music. No, that's that's not true. Thomas the Tank Engine's great. Did music play like an important role in in the household? Was it a thing that was going on? Yeah, definitely. My dad always had music playing, especially Saturday morning, Sunday morning kind of thing. It was very kind of like weekend euphoria kind of thing, you know. Um... Well, not, you know, like euphoria, but like very atmospheric. They had the sort of hi-fi cranked, you know, and the doors open and stuff like that. What sort um, of thing? He would play Beach Boys, um, Supertramp, uh, Fleetwood Mac, Fleetwood Mac often. Um, that kind of thing. You get the picture, you know. And my mum also lo- loves music, um, so she would do similar things. You know, she always had... Like, a, a hi-fi was, like, an essential part of wherever we were, you know? My dad was very much a, like, best of kind of guy, which, which when I kind of grew up, it kind of annoyed me that I knew bands, but not by their albums, just by their kind of best of. Like, they, they, were, they were, like, CDs that I thought were the albums, you know? <laughs> and it was just, like, songs that were sort of, like, 15 years apart and stuff. What about the first piece of music that you bought that was yours? The first single or album or...? First, uh, well, would have been a CD. Um, that would be the one of the Batman movie soundtracks. The Prince Batman one? Unfortunately uh, not. <laughs> no, I was too young then. In hindsight, it's probably like the classiest one, obviously. That's a weird choice for a first thing to own. Well, I mean, it's just because I was obsessed with the movie. I saw the movie, my mum took me, and, you know, I was like seven years old or something, eight years old, and I was just... Blown away in the way that kids are by action movies, especially Batman. Uh, still am, like, however many years later when the, new, when the new Batman comes out. But the I just remember the music was just like, it's impossible to say whether it's because I actually thought the music was sick or it was just because it was tied to Batman climbing around the city, you know? like so. But the CD had like U2, um, it had Mazzy Star... Method Man. This is all good. Flaming Lips, exactly. So, like, in retrospect, it was, like, all really good music. What about the first piece of music that kind of... When you reach that point and you're like, okay, now, I'm a teenager, I know mm. bands, this is this is my music, this is the group. Because you, grunge was a big thing for you, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably Nirvana or Silverchair. You know, an, an entire album would just be... I just have it on kind of repeat. More so Silverchair, just because they were youngish. They were kind of like 15 when they got signed. And I kind of, and they were from Australia. They're from like a rural sort of part of Australia, which I immediately identified with. You know, like that's the kind of thing you don't really think about when you're that age that like kind of stars, people that are successful, that are like you, you know, that you identify with you fall in love with much easier. You know, I, re- I didn't realise that was a thing. I was just like, oh, these guys are sick, you know. <laughs> I come from Birmingham, and when I was a teenager, because I'm a bit older, I saw Duran Duran ah, okay. on TV, and I was like, Cause Birmingham's in the Midlands. It's, like, not a particularly glamorous Black Sabbath. Place. Yeah. Ah, okay. And we were like, wow, you can be on, on like, mo- sort of in the Bahamas on a motorboat with, with, with models. Yeah. For, and you're from Birmingham? Yeah. What? Yeah, I get that. I get that thing. In fact, I remember thinking, like, Okay, well, I'm 12 now. I've got three more years. <laughs> you know? I was like, three more years, and I've still 
got it there in time that Silver Chair did. <laughs> what about the first gig you went to? It was probably like a punk rock gig in Perth. Oh, yeah, it, it, it would have been an, an underage show. Like that um, me and a few friends, a couple of friends would have been to. Just raucous kind of Australian punk music. Mosh pits and sweat and blood. Well, <laughs> shoes. <laughs> shoes flying everywhere. That's, yeah, I remember those gigs. Shoes flying everywhere. Yeah, well, I mean, like, it was just this completely new thing. You know, go into a room and there's a bunch of other <laughs> sweaty teenagers that are into the same music and everyone's just going mental. It's like, whoa, what the... What, what is this? This is crazy. This is not normal life. It was just... I was con- intoxicated by it, you know? Was there the... I, whatever's happening in the audience in the mosh pit with, with I'm taking my shoe off and I'm throwing it around but also I, I, I want to be I want to be doing this all yeah. the time oh yeah totally I, well I mean like I, I tried crowd surfing once and you know I, like I got up there I didn't know what to do so I just kind of like waved to the band <laughs> you know in a kind of like a, I kind of like gave them a thumbs up or something you know like in a kind of a worship way you know um, but oh yeah I mean but like that was well after I'd become obsessed with trying to become a rock star you know that was years after like i hadn't been to a gig and until years of into it you know i just sit in my room with the guitar so it was long established by then <laughs> you saw the white stripes was that a big one for you oh yeah that was that was my first um proper gig proper gig that i that i um used my brother's id to get into <laughs> it was over 18s and um it was the night before like a big school exam, ancient <laughs> history, I believe, uh, the night before, and I had no friends that wanted to go because everyone was studying. <laughs> everyone made the responsible decision. And I was like, no, I'm going. I'm going. That's, there's no two ways about it, you know. So I borrowed my brother's ID. We don't, we don't look totally alike. We look similar, you know, similar kind of facial features, but he had totally different coloured hair. <laughs> But uh, but not lined up. Got my you know had my ticket. I'd, I'd already bought my ticket. It was like eighty dollars or something. And um, yeah, it was not in my life. I was like, I can't believe I made it in. You know, I bought a beer. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna buy a beer. You know. <laughs> What's the White Stripes track we should we should play? Um, I guess it's like uh, Dead Leaves in the Dirty Ground. Just because like whenever I hear the start of that, it just reminds me of putting that album on. So you know, it's just like it's just one of those like time warp albums where I'm just like. I can, I can feel the table that I, the, my, my like homework table that I sat at when I listened to it. Okay, so say say I come around, around this kind of era. I come around your place and I open the door to your to your bedroom and you. What do I find? Tell me about the studious young man. What did it look like? Well, depending on which part of my teenage years room you walked in on. It I mean, obviously, very wildly. <laughs> Walking in on a teenage boy it can be a dangerous thing. I'm more thinking. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I'm more thinking about the kind of like right. Okay, I'm I'm going to start tackling these instruments. And I'm going to start making noises with them. Kind of around then. Well, you know, it depends if it's my dad's place or my mum's place. So okay. I kind of went between. Um, dad's place was quite sort of clean. You know, I was sort of instructed to keep it quite clean if it was messy i'd get in trouble so and like and we had a music room like my dad had a music room so that was where all the junk was cool. so i only had like my guitar in the room everything else was amps and stuff from the music room but my mum's place when i lived there that was like i shared it with my brother i slept on a stretcher like one of those like kind of <laughs> temporary beds and uh junk everywhere it smelled <laughs> um i had my guitar a little samic amp that was about a foot high and wide at a playstation a little tv sitting on a thing that, like you know that would just regularly fall off just because of you know <laughs> there was so much stuff it was mental but uh yeah that's y- y- you can kind of get the picture <laughs> yeah i th- i think so i i because re- i do this show with a lot of people and i i do like I like the first band names. I like people's first bands because they're always, there's so much desire to be kind of portentous and mm-hmm. we are called the dot, 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 and yeah, and you can, you can hear pens being byroed into the back of jackets. Oh, absolutely. Come yeah. on, man. Oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> That's going to take a lot. That's going to take a lot. Uh, I mean, there were tens of band names, but none of them made any sense. Come on, let's have a couple. Ah. Uh, 
<laughs> I knew this day would come. I knew this day would come. There was, I'm trying to think of the least offensive one, like the least terrible one. I think me and Dom had a band called Garlic Farm for a while. That could be worse. Was it, like, I didn't even know what garlic was. <laughs> like, everyone I told the name to was like, oh, I can just smell it, you know? I was like, what do you mean? Like, I was that kind of uncultured. I didn't even really know what garlic was when I was 11. One more, one more. No, that's it. That's what you're going to get out of <laughs> that's me. That's what we're going to get. That's, it's, I'm already regretting <laughs> telling you. If you say too many, they will follow you around online forever. So I do, I do understand. Oh, sure, yeah. I yeah. do understand the reticence. First gig you played, we're moving forward here a bit now. It was a, a concert put on by the music school that I went to. So uh, my mum sent me, because I want to get drum lessons, she sent me to this um, kind of tuition place that was nearby our house. It was kind of this place you go, it was like an old converted house. And each room was like a little... Um, study room. Study room, yeah, yeah. And they had like drums and guitars and like, you know, you, you go there and you choose what instrument you want to do. So I was like, I want to do drums, you know. So they would teach you drums. They always had like the coolest teachers you know the guy that taught me drums was like in this cool rock band in perth you know i was like this is you know it was just the coolest thing because music had very recently just become just had taken over my identity you know like up until then i was kind of a bit of delinquent or a bit of just kind of just to just get out to trouble you know with kids but as soon as i started playing drums it was like it was complete laser complete, that's the only thing complete takeover of who Brilliant. i was yeah, so anyway, every Saturday, so they'd, like, pick kids that, like, they'd find a kid that played drums, find a kid that played guitar, and they'd put kids together in a band. So on Saturday, all, all the kids come together and play in a band. So I, I was, like, in a band of five. It was me and two other guys and two girls. Again, I was just like, this is the coolest thing imaginable. And so anyway, so every year they put on a, sh a concert uh, where each band plays, you play two songs. Uh, I, got, I did a drum solo. Of course you did. I think I think my stepmom still has a video of that somewhere. What was the songs? What did you do? Uh, we did Sweet Child of Mine. We did Are You Gonna Go My Way, oh, Lenny Kravitz. Wow. And I also got put in a couple of other bands because I was showing um, promise, you know. Mm -hmm. So the couple of other bands uh, of sort of older people, like kind of mums and dads and stuff that didn't have a drummer. So there was this, uh, this all, all ladies band and they did, um, if you're not in it for love, do, 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 do. I'm out of here. Shania Twain. All right. They did that. So I was in a band with uh, some mums. That was cool. But this is good for your chops. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean like, they just asked me not to hit as hard as I was. <laughs> Let's leap forward to uh, the first professional band experience so the first time you're like okay this is this is what we are doing someone might maybe give us some money for this um, um this is pro even though it probably wasn't at the time but it felt like like the first time i received payment that's a good question yeah for playing music <laughs> um that would have been <laughs> a year ago <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah only just um no uh it would have been a like a perth kind of local music scene gig because um, Dom and I kind of played in a few band competitions in Perth. Like that was kind of the only thing I knew how to do to like play in front of an audience. Like there's kind of band comms everywhere, you mm. know, battle of the bands, clash of the bands, next big <laughs> thing, you know, amp fest. It was all kind of this kind of stuff. Amp and fest, um, that's good. Yeah. All, all the, all the different names. <laughs> and, uh, that was all I knew because I was still underage. I was still seventeen, so that was like I was just I was out of school, but I was still seventeen, so I couldn't. We couldn't play in pubs yet, so it would have been as soon as uh, I turned eighteen that I played at some show where they have like ten bands on, you know, and you're like the second band. <laughs> and we would have got like thirty dollars and a jug of uh, Swan Draft, which is like on, on the cheaper end of the spectrum. Did you ever win anything? Oh, in like band comps. Yeah. We we ca we came kind of like actually we came second to this band called Mink Muscle Creek, which I, which I later joined, and they're kind of my homies now. You know, we're all mixed up in the same thing. So yeah, but it's funny because up until that point, I was extreme. I was kind of like I didn't know how to process the fact that it was a competition of music, so I kind of just like became really competitive about it. <laughs> 
you know? So I'd go to, you know, I'd go and check out this band, like, oh, what are they doing? You know, like, in hindsight, it was kind of, um, like, it's great that they were doing that. It's great for the community, that kind of stuff. But the idea of putting kids in band comps, those are such kind of formative years of experiencing playing live. And the fact there was this kind of, like, competitiveness was injected to it. You know, I feel like maybe that's not the right way to introduce kids to music. But anyway... I was kind of competitive until I saw Mink Muscle Creek and that all just kind of dissolved away. I was just like, I just want to be friends with these guys. I just want to, you know. Be part of that world. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to hang out with them and like we kind of instantly made friends. And um, the whole, the fact that it was a competition just instantly melted away and we ended up coming first and second, so. (laughs) And I was totally cool with that. I was like, no, no, you guys, you got this. This is all you. What was the first release that you were on? What was the first music that was out there that that would have that name? That would probably be our first EP. Really? Well, well, I mean, I sold copies of Tame Impala CDs for like $2 or whatever. Like Just, a token amount, you know. Did you sell money? Uh, yeah. I made them out of um, cardboard that I got from this uh, law firm that... <laughs> I was working at. You know, that because of law firms, they have these, like, manila folders. To make a file, you needed a whole manila folder that says, like, two, um, you know, like that. And you get and you cut one, so you, get, you, use, you use one and a half things, and then there's this other one left over, and it's kind of, like, beige cream coloured. You know that kind of colour? Yeah, yeah, stationary colour. Stationary colour, yeah. So that became the, like, colour of the... <laughs> Tame Impala EPs. Tell me about that first EP, because it's it's good sounding. Oh, thanks. You know, I mean, they've got a lot of character to them. Mm-hmm. Still, you listen to them today, and they, they, there is, I don't know, there's a real texture mm-hmm. to that stuff. Yeah, it's funny what kind of character can come out of something where the person has no idea what they're doing. I mean, they, that's basically why they have so much character. I had no idea what I was doing. Because that's going to become the myth now. It's like, oh, yeah, you were just you were just feeling your way around it. But that mm-hmm. it was actually, that's the case. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, absolutely. 100%. Like, I didn't understand the first concept of mixing and sound processing. Like, I knew what reverb was, you know? I knew what distortion was, but... But, yeah, I mean, I haven't listened to those songs in ages. It's, it's, pr- it's pretty difficult, so... I'll get around to it. You mentioned the Flaming Lips earlier. When did you mm. first see the Flaming Lips? Because they're a band that kind of had a bit of an impact on... Definitely. ...the world for you. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think... Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 as I said, I heard them... They had this song, uh, Bad Days, that was on the Batman Forever soundtrack. And I didn't really know who they were. I kind of just, like... I just played the whole CD, and I was like, oh, this band's a Flaming Lips. I didn't later hear them until we saw them in Japan. We saw them live. And um, it was kind of just like, just a different experience. You know, I just, I I wasn't ready for it, you know? Like I thought they were kind of just gonna be a band, you know? (laughs) You know, like that's that's a festival rock show, you know? But like, I I didn't realize how much kind of like, how much of a uh, thing that they just made out of everything they do. It's a terrible way of describing it, but it's, it's just like the most kind of cosmic experience. The idea that it's a band on a stage is like a distant remnant of like what it started out as, you know, there's like... Exactly. It's more of it's more of a cosmic theatrical show. Not not theatrical in like terms of characters and stuff, but just it was just it just kind of throwing that basic kind of thing to the to the curb. You know, it was something completely different to change the way I look at live music. We'll build up to the finale. No, we won't. We'll start with the finale. Exactly. And, and then we'll just keep going. Exactly. Because why? You know we're going to get there. So let's just get there now. Exactly. And make it great. In a speaker, t- talking about kind of myths around the band, the, the myth is that, that that was an absolutely awful record to make. It was a very difficult record to make. In a speaker? Yeah. Is that true? Uh, well, a hard... Only in that every album is difficult to make. <laughs> Only in the, you know, you, you, it, uh, It's never easy. It's never easy. It kills a, a small part of you each time. <laughs> you know, a small part of you dies every time you make an album. That's, that's just the sacrifice. Only in that way, you know. What do you remember from those, from those sessions? Well, I mean, we rented a, a house that was, um, a few hours south of Perth, just kind of on this massive hill overlooking the beach. It was, it's this crazy house. It's like a complete wooden shack, but it's the size of a mansion. And um, the views are just out of control. And so I would just sort of... I had everything set up in the main living room. And I would just kind of 
wake up and record for had like for like, like six weeks on end. That sounds. I mean, I just think, wow, that sounds brilliant. That yeah, sounds like a lovely. Exactly. The reality of it was, I didn't <laughs> actually get a lot done because I'd wake up and record about like a thirty second or like a sort of a sixteen bar thing, and it, like together that with the scenery, like take take uh, the intro, take the first song, like it's not meant to be. I just have I just have that on repeat for hours, you know, with the bass thing and the guitar thing. And like I'd be like, oh, okay, it's it's done, you know. Like I don't need to I don't need to do anything more today to feel like I've achieved something. I can just the scenery made it seem like it was perfect. It was complete, you know, which is which can be the danger of being in a place that's too beautiful. I never thought about that aspect of things. It's like, yeah, so what are you going to do? Everyone that listens to it, have they got to come here? Exactly. <laughs> no, but like, but albums that are made in a, a dingy apartment, you know, like staring at staring out at a brick wall. Suddenly, when you t- when you, like you'll do everything you can to make that music as lush and as beautiful and as kind of transportive as you can. And then when you listen to it in a place that is completely beautiful, it goes to another level. You know, like if I'm ever kind of working on a song in my studio in Perth and uh, I've kind of like hit a wall with it you know I'm kind of like oh it's kind of like just a bit worn out on me I just uh, stick on the headphones and go for a walk you know I, I, I forgot how kind of um, revitalising for a song that is you just walk I just walk to the beach you know it's kind of just like the song has a new life and when it came time to finishing the album that's when I lost it you know that's that's when the that's when the dying started uh, because I had to mix it and I knew that record labels were waiting for it fans that I now had were waiting for it and it just did my head in now the EP when we got signed the EP was already done I just selected songs that I already recorded in my bedroom but recording the album it was all fun while I was doing it but when I had to finish it it was like the pressure came down like a ton of bricks you know and so that's when like I was just like wasn't sleeping and I had to I um I had to go and mix it. Well, I went to mix it with Dave Fridman, who produced the Flaming Lips, by no coincidence. You know, I was like, okay, I want to deal with that guy. I was jet lagged and just gone mental, basically. How did you, if you're moving on to lonerism, then then the audience gets bigger and thing things change. The thing, or you know, even if you don't, the world around you starts changing. Mm-hmm. You know, how did you? Because it's like that's what you want. You want people to hear it, but you don't necessarily know what it's going to be like when that happens Mm -hmm. how do you think you cope with it well are you enjoying it this aspect of it uh it's difficult to say it's pretty tough when you know everyone's hearing a song for the first time because up until that point the song is mine you know (laughs) like this is mine this is my song no one else has really heard it like i mean obviously have friends and manager and stuff but the song is like it belongs to me. It's kind of it's a difficult thing to describe, but um, releasing it for the first time is always it's always tough. It just it feels like you're handing it over. It, it like it, it it no longer belongs to me. It belongs to the people now. You know, it's like well pushing it off into the world. And then so I usually can't listen to a song after I've released it for about a year. A year. Yeah. So like uh, yeah, every song, every song, and uh, and it's it's only getting worse too. <laughs> <laughs> like when uh, Lonerism came out, you know, I was I was obviously like loving the songs until then. And then it got released, and I was like, oh. And I, we had to make a film clip for one of the songs, and I was like, I don't want to think about it. You know, like feels like we're gonna go backwards. I was just like, I don't want to even. Well, I, I was like, it was kind of tough, you know. And then Currents happened, and um, Let It Happen came out. I thought it was trash. <laughs> <laughs> I thought. I thought it was like, how can anyone... I remember just thinking, like, how can anyone listen to this and think it's good? Really? Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, I'm I'm sure some people currently think that. But um, I just remember thinking that reviewers that that said it was great were just being lenient on me for some reason. I was trying to work out why they would be lenient on me. And I, I, I deduced that it was because I was Australian. I was like, maybe they think that Australians are kind of like... Uh, you know. He needs a break. Let's be nice to him. Right. I was like, maybe this going easy because I'm Australian. Maybe they think Australians like aren't as sort of progressed with music, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, Yeah, because reviewers often just the nice for no reason. Well, exactly. I mean, like that's the kind of delusion. <laughs> that's, the, that's the delusion that um, I'm talking about. Tell me about that moment when, when people want a little piece of you and that can be like, oh, wow, I get a chance to work with her and him. Mm-hmm. This is a great door to be opened. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden... People people want that thing that you do. 
Mm -hmm. and that thing that you do becomes almost like a commodity. Mm -hmm. That's a strange positive and negative environment to Mm -hmm. be in. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. It's nice to feel (laughs) wanted. Uh, Arguably, I started making music in the first place because I wanted to feel wanted, you know? And so when when you... I mean, like, and that was, like, a tough thing for me to sort of digest, too, that I had this thing that people wanted, you know? Like, I have this... And, like, I know that I'm sure a lot of people um, find that kind of soul-destroying or they find it kind of, um, like, oh, everyone's out to take my special source, you know? <laughs> but they're going to take I, my picture and capture my soul. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But, I mean, honestly, it kind of, like, it couldn't be... Um, F- further from how I feel, you know, uh, I like that I have this thing that I can offer that no one else can, you know, like to me, that's kind of like the epitome of um, having a craft or something, you know, having a having a special ability or having a uh, that's probably a much better word that I can't think of right now, but um, it makes me feel like uh, like I have something kind of unique to offer. I mean, obviously, you have to be careful with it because. As you say, everyone will take a piece and then it won't be special anymore. Um, if everyone has your sauce, it's not a special sauce anymore. That's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it is if you keep the recipe a secret. But and you let people yeah. have just a little tiny bit on their burger, maybe just on the side. Right, right. But people are smart these days. You know, that's why you got to keep changing your recipe because people are smart. People will work out how something is done, you know. How do you feel about Glastonbury? This is this is a site of, uh, of a former triumph for you. It's a place that... Yeah fits in your world i think absolutely well yeah i can't wait it's um it's the greatest festival in the world you know like, I, I don't i don't need to tell an english person that do i i mean yeah it's a it's a yeah i can't wait <laughs> how was it when you went the first time because people don't really know what's i mean even if you think you know what it's going to be like you don't really know what it's like to you get yeah. it. can you remember first kind of stepping off the tour bus and going okay yeah i remember thinking it was like middle earth <laughs> you know the first time, or like maybe even the first two times that we went, we didn't really like do Glastonbury. You know, we were kind of like uh, almost intimidated by the size of it. I mean, we we're instantly struck by how non music festival y everyone's attitude was. Like, everyone was just loving it, you know. This. And, uh, but we didn't really like sort of know anyone that was staying there. I, I don't think we slept there. I think we played our show and left, you know. It was only kind of like. I think like every year we've been, we've kind of like delved deeper into Glastonbury. You know, last and then so last year was pretty. We were there until Monday morning, and I have no idea what's going to happen this year. But I feel like it's best not to have any expectation or any plan. You know, <laughs> just let Glastonbury do its thing. Uh, I, I kind of even feel bad for asking you what's happening with the next record because you're kind of. I'd rather just let you get on with it and not ask you, but it's kind of my job to ask you about sure, it. Sure, you can. <laughs> you can. How's it going? Uh, it's going good. <laughs> yeah, it's going good. I mean, like I've obviously got a got a, got a, a strong filter on at the moment, um, but uh, it's going good. I'm 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 really I'm really excited. I mean, yeah. Um, What's the last song we should play? We're going to go on a song that's a choice of yours. Ah. Anything you want. It can be something you've loved for your whole life or heard this morning, something of yours or someone... Oh, Jay really likes this song by Jai Paul. Uh, it's called Do You Love Her Now? He got me onto it the other morning. It's really cool. But I must stress, it's his find, guys. It's not this... I didn't find this song. Because this is kind of Jay will get before. Like, <laughs> hey, I, that was my find. You know, I found this track because he loves Jai Paul. <laughs> Um, so I gotta give him credit for that discovery there. Uh, it's been good to speak to you. Thank you so cool. much. Cool. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs>